they're doing something. And certainly the people that work there that become disillusioned and want to be out of the system, apparently that comes with consequences. I know people, I know someone in a lab that actually is funded by Monsanto at a major university. She, when she's talked about geoengineering, she's told me now she's been pulled into a room twice and told if you continue to talk about geoengineering, there'll be consequences. What does that mean? Weather channel helping to hide geoengineering assault. Again, there's no chance that these guys don't know what they're doing. In fact, they went into a five-minute apology after the big polar vortex theater that they went through. A five-minute apology on air to try to excuse their way out of the, the sort of theater they put on. So, I mean, the, at this point, Rothschilds owns Weather Channel, Weather Central, Weather Underground. They have to control the message. The people doing the weather modification must control the message. You have Raytheon does all the weather modeling for NOAA and the National Weather Service, Raytheon up to their eyeballs in weather modification. They have to control the message. They have to put out a forecast, which is really the schedule weather, in a way that convinces people it's natural when it's not. The Daily Sheeple. Weapons of mass destruction, mainstream media and corporate government pushing America closer to becoming an absolute police state. I think we all know we're headed that direction. Yes, and when it comes down, it'll probably come down hard and fast. And the sicker we are from breathing this stuff, the less able we are to, to stand up. EPA cover-up, very important here. And this is something I know firsthand. I've, I've been in one high-level EPA meeting in Sacramento at California EPA, arranged by a congressional rep, five top people there. And I was told to my face, in so many words, the system is rigged from bottom to top, that they are mandated to test for, I wasn't allowed to record anything there, but I was told that they're mandated to test for combustion particulates only. The rest of the sample goes out the window. Doesn't matter what's in it. They don't care what's in the rain. It, it, can, it can be radioactive, as some of it is now. They don't care. So that, again, the system is designed not to show this. They test for, if you're PM10 and PM2.5, the particulate matter they test for. We're talking about particulates that are exponentially smaller. They go virtually untested, virtually under the radar. So any notion that people, and you hear this excuse from people a lot, if this was going on, we hear about it, not true. Let's talk about our local media. The record searchlight. Drought, drought sure to be changes. Now, this is a recent article. For eight or nine years, I've, I've certainly been screaming locally that the more these programs go on, the drier it's going to get. And here we are. And, and still local media, in many ways, seems to be doing its best to hide what's going on. Another Searchlight article, this is one I wrote from 2004. And still to date, they have not done any stories on geoengineering, climate engineering, nothing of the sort. So how is it we all know what's going on and media won't cover it? Methane threat, underdisclosed, another, another article that Searchlight published that I wrote about methane. Has the Searchlight covered the methane issue that is literally an unfolding global cataclysm right now? Not a word, not a word. Shasta board to talk about Jet's metal dumping. Kim Trail's conspiracy. The man who wrote this story called me prior to it and I said, please don't use the word Kim Trails. I recognize the scientific terms, climate engineering and geoengineering. He never used either one of those terms, not one. Because they don't want people to find science. They have their own agenda and they don't seem to give a damn about what's going on. And I hope everybody in this room considers what story might come out after this evening's presentation and what sort of spin might come out after this presentation, because people, people there have not done justice in any way, shape, or form to this incredibly dire issue so far. So it's going to be up to us to hold them accountable, all of us. Can't be done alone. Can't go down and, and stand in front of the searchlight and demand that they tell the truth by yourself. It takes hundreds of people to be there so they can't ignore us anymore. It's going to take all of us to organize to put this on the radar. If we could put it on the radar locally, it would be on the radar globally. Guarantee it. If we could break the ice here, it would cause a fracture that would run around the globe. Also from the searchlight, what's behind the dry weather? The ridiculously resilient ridge. Again, the, the elephant in the room completely ignored, completely ignored in spite of the fact that we have metering for these facilities that put these frequencies out that cause these phenomenon like HARP, still goes completely ignored. 
Species loss, again, I want to drive this point home. We are in the sixth great mass extinction now, today. This is not theory. You can verify everything I've said here tonight. We are experiencing species extinction rate at a speed never seen short of Im meteor impact on planet Earth. We are in free fall right now. Does media cover this? No, they cover some little drama that, they, again, they pluck out of a hat. Are we doomed? Why civilizations like ours fail? On the path we're on, yes. Yes. If you rationally analyze data on the path we are on, we have no chance. And there are scientists now speaking out about this. Guy McPherson from University of Arizona is a professor emeritus there. I have high regard for Guy. He's a friend. And he has calculated right now with the decimation that's being inflicted on our climate, there will be no life left in the northern hemisphere in a very short time, perhaps even a few decades or shorter. And that doesn't mean that everything goes along fine until then. So we're talking about a very different planet. And you can find mainstream scientists that will argue this completely, but the same scientists who have lied to us again and again and again and again. Where would we start? So the bottom line is on our current trajectory, we are headed down a dead end with no return. We need to change course. This is important to remember as well. For people who, again, this is a teaching tool that we will put out for others so they understand that there are a lot of sources of, quote, human engineering of the planet. All the decimation that humanity has caused, and we've caused plenty, are still a form of geoengineering in a sense. It's, it's altering the dynamics of the planet. So it's important to remember this. Too many people want to put it in this box or that, as if if we stop geoengineering, we could all drive Winnebago's from now on. It's not the case. I'm not saying we wouldn't be in exponentially better shape without geoengineering, because we would. The planet could respond, would compensate for a lot of the damage done. But it's important to remember that we're hurting the planet in a lot of ways. Is Fukushima an extinction level event? I'm almost near the end of this presentation, so bear with me. Yes, media is not covering Fukushima. How can that be? How can that possibly be? We have three reactors in Fukushima, and this is related to geoengineering. I'll weave the two together. Three reactors in full-blown meltdown in Fukushima. Burnt through the containment vessel. They're burning into the planet right now. There's no end in sight. There's no technology to deal with this, none. This radiation is coming our way. We've gotten, on the east side of Lake Shasta, 300 counts per minute of radiation about a week ago. It's about five times background. It's showing up all over the west coast. You have uh, 15 tuna that were tested off the west coast a year and a half ago, all of them radioactive. Why is the media not reporting on this? This should be a glaring red flag, just like the geoengineering. Anything that could make the population a little bit uncomfortable, media does their best to spin it or hide it. And this, as far as human insanity, and people say, well, this is another excuse you hear from people. Why would they do this to themselves? This can't be happening. They wouldn't do that to themselves. Well, why would they do this 2,000 times over? 2,000 nuclear bombs have been detonated on this planet, and everyone alive is contaminated from that. We all have strontium-90 in our bones from these nuclear detonations. Did these guys care when they went in the South Seas and virtually took whatever island they wanted, kicked the populations off, and set up big demonstrations of their power, like kids in a sandbox, like crazy kids in a sandbox? Did that stop them? They do whatever they want. They do whatever they want until someone says no. No, we've had enough. This should be a shining example, the nuclear detonations around the globe and the fact that they've done it wherever they wanted, almost whenever they wanted. It's no different than geoengineering. And now, with Fukushima, because they're spraying the eastern Pacific and that aerosolizes the moisture, it migrates much more effectively on us. They can literally migrate that radiation anywhere they want and drop it anywhere they want. There's particles like fluoride, and we're getting fluoride in tests now. We have fluoride from tests in uh, Norway, 60 tests with fluoride. So fluoride particulates, if those are used to migrate rain, and other particulates we feel have similar properties, if they're hit with a certain frequency, those particulates combine and coagulate, which would then cause that moisture to fall. So they can, in theory, migrate that moisture wherever they want, hit it with the right frequency, and it will fall. So in the case of the radiation, instead of raining out over the Pacific, as it would, not that that's good, but it's better than it raining on us, now it can be migrated much more effectively over us. 
Fukushima, climate change, near-term extinction, resignation versus surrender. Does the horizon look bleak? Yeah, it looks very bleak. Does that mean we give up? No. Does that mean we don't have any chance? No. We absolutely have a chance to radically change our direction. But a person has to resign themselves to the fact that we're not guaranteed a happy ending. None of us are. Never have been. Not at any point in time, ever. But does that mean we sit down and do nothing? And for every, every time that people look at an issue like this and go home and go golfing the next day and, and watch football and, and ignore this until the next time they spray, and I get a lot of people that call me like that. They'll call about once a month when there's a very bad spray day, let off a little steam, and that's the last I hear for maybe another month. And I've gotten to the point where I said, don't call me anymore. I don't want to hear it. What have you done in the last month to help? It's going to take all of us. This is not an issue that's going to go away. It's not going to go away. In fact, it's, they literally have their hands on our throat right now. They can shut off that moisture as long as they want. And I'm not speculating. We have study after study after study from places like MIT, Scientific American. I'm not making this stuff up. I challenge anybody to investigate it. When they aerosolize the atmosphere, it causes drought, period. We have the satellite photos. We know they're spraying upstream from us. It can't not be drought here especially with the jet stream manipulations. This is a 2 plus 2 equals 4 equation. It's that simple. So when you have that kind of control over a population, you have them by the throat. They indeed have us by the throat. Something we all need to remember. Resource wars, geopolitics in a world of dwindling energy supplies. Resource wars are happening around the globe right now. This is what you have happening in the Middle East. It's not about democracy. It's not about freedom. It's not about civil rights. It's about resources, period. To stabilize a country, it's a lot easier to go in and take the resources, and that's what it's about, plain and simple. Right now, it takes about one barrel of energy, one barrel of hydrocarbon to get seven out of the ground. In 1900, it, one barrel could get 100 out of the ground. So not only is there a lot less hydrocarbon, it's a lot harder to get out of the ground. That's a lot harder to process. And now there's a race for these resources at the same time the planet is melting down. So we are entering into uncharted territory from many directions. Population. I know this is a sensitive issue with many, but it needs to be considered that the planet can't support what's here right now. And those in power know this. And I would make the same argument that if anybody's going to go, that they should be first. And all this time that they have, instead of, instead of putting the truth out, instead of making people understand the true mathematical equation we face, we've been bombarded with media Distraction, weapons of mass distraction, the media, WMD. People need to consider our, whole, our, our entire figure here. And, and what do we face? When we look at lack of resources, we look at decimation of our natural systems from geoengineering. I can't grow a garden anymore, so how am I going to feed myself? How's my family going to feed itself? Our garden doesn't grow anymore. We used to grow a 100-foot bed with no problem at all. We couldn't grow 10-foot last year. How do we feed ourselves? For those that are unfamiliar with Easter Island, Island in the Pacific that was a paradise. 16 million unique palm trees on that island, a very unique species of food source for the islanders. They cut these palm trees down to roll their statues around. And one has to wonder, they literally cut every single palm tree down on the whole island. The island collapsed, their civilization collapsed, they turned to cannibalism. That's the tale of Easter Island. What, what were they thinking when they were down to maybe a million palm trees, and then maybe 100,000, and then maybe the last one? Didn't it dawn on anybody that we're going to have a problem? And we seem to be in the same boat. And so right now, again, why I focused on geoengineering exclusively for 10 years, because quite simply, if we don't stop this and we render the planet unable to support us and support our lives, we'll have nothing left to save and we will end up like the Easter Islanders. Arctic Doomsday Vault grows a few seeds. For those that haven't heard of the Ar Arctic Doomsday Vault, Bill Gates is involved with this one. And they have put several hundred thousand seed varieties in the Arctic to save them because they know what's coming. They absolutely know it. This is science fact. This vault exists. Anybody who doesn't know about it should look it up. They don't do this for nothing. The power structure knows what's coming. It's a lot closer than people understand. Why is the Department of Homeland Security buying so many bullets? 2.2 billion rounds, I think is the last I heard. 2.2 billion rounds of 40 caliber hollow point. How can people go on about their lives knowing what's what sort of preparations are being made. They're digging holes, they're, they're, they're making preparations. This is science fact. I mean, I, there's no denying that purchase. Nobody denied it. It happened. So again, we all need to pay attention to this. 
And the thing with geoengineering is for those who are involved with these programs, our military brothers and sisters, of which there's great people in the military, if we could all work together, if we could bring this to light, if we could expose this issue, those people are brothers and sisters in the military who are doing things that they don't understand the ramifications of. If we could reach them, I believe they would refuse to participate. I believe that that is our chance of stopping this issue because we need them on our side. We need them to understand what they're doing to their fellow citizens. That's where we all need to work together to bring this issue to light. This is clearly just a depiction, but I, I want to drive the point home. That's exactly where we're headed, and we're headed there fast. If we don't have an atmosphere that'll support life, the atmosphere is as thin as a layer of paint on a basketball. It's the only thing that sustains our lives. To have this sort of experimentation going on above our heads every day, and that tiny, very, very thin, fragile layer, that is the only thing that protects us in an incredibly hostile environment, this will be the end result. It absolutely will be the end result. Will we contemplate this after it happens? It's too late then. It's absolutely too late. Every day matters at this point. I want to stress this. This is a non-linear equation. It's not like you can look backward at a graph and say it's taken us this long to reach this point so we have that long in the future. Non-linear, exponential. Things are, things are unfolding at an absolutely blinding pace. This is the planet with geoengineering. It cannot respond. It cannot respond. No matter how much carbon we put in the atmosphere, we put a lot. The planet has done very well with this much carbon in the past. Sea levels were much higher. That's a problem for civilization, but the planet thrived. The Pliocene Epoch, 5.2 million years ago, carbon was 25% higher than today. The western US wasn't a droughted out desert as we're headed for. It was very lush because as the temperature goes up and carbon goes up, so does rain. The planet responds. But the rain can't go up now because of geoengineering. It can't. The planet can't respond. And this is in sense what we have with the planet. So instead of more rain coming and our forests being invigorated with an acidic rain and lots of it, they're literally being droughted out and poisoned because the bioavailable metals literally poison trees, poison organisms. So the planet must be released from the geoengineering straitjacket that it's in. Last couple slides. Venus syndrome. This is a real scientific scenario. We are on this track, and this is the planet we'll have if we continue on this track. In fact, the data here is so dire and so applicable to, to where we're headed. This is a point I want to make about geoengineering. Their goal, their stated goal, is to create a higher albedo for the planet, more reflectivity, block some of the sun, keep it from heating up. Venus's albedo is two and a half times that of Earth. That's why it's so bright. Two and a half times as reflective as Earth. Is Venus habitable? Obviously not. It's 900 degrees on the surface. But yet it has two and a half times the reflectivity. So apparently there's a little bit more to life on the planet than putting a reflective coating of toxic metals around it. But that's about as short as the geoengineer's thinking is. And again, uh, aside from weather weapons and everything else they're using this for, this is the track we're on if we don't change course. And, and that's why the geoengineering, geoengineering issue is so important. Just want to illustrate a road that, you know, sometimes the road can look very long before you, but if there's any light at the end of that road, and we still have a little bit of light at the end of this road, but we don't have a lot of time. The sun's going down very quickly. I need help. I can't do this alone. I absolutely can't. I'm doing everything I can, but locally, people are needed to organize and, and do certain things that could put us on the radar. If we had 300 people, for example, show up in front of the record searchlight and demand that they cover climate engineering and that they cover a contamination issue that is beyond dispute in Shasta County, beyond dispute. There is a massive contamination issue. It appears directly related to these programs. It's not coming from China. We have CARB studies to prove that, California Resources Board. Not that I have love for them, but, but they've proven this materials are not coming from China. But we need people to be willing to spend a certain amount of time, people to help organize others to show up at a certain place at a certain time to help us put this on the radar. Because on our path right now, if they keep the water shut off, we're going to turn our spigots on this summer. Nothing's going to come out. And they can keep it shut off as long as they want. It's going to take all of us in this battle. One tool you can use, and this is the last slide. There's a filmmaker named George Barnes. 
He's been here before. He's a good personal friend. He's made a film called Look Up. This is probably the single best film you can use to introduce people to this subject. And if you just refine the process, it's quite easy to invite people over. This, is a, this film's won six, eight awards already. We're going, I'm, going, I'm speaking in LA in February for another film festival. I think the film will win another award. It's, it's 45 minutes long. It's very professionally done, narrated by William Baldwin. If you have people over with a film like this and give them some data, DVDs, uh, flyers, it's a lot more credible than running out in the street and ranting and pointing at the sky, which doesn't work too well. When you have solid data to pass on, that works. If you arm yourself with tools, and if people can organize, and we have some very good organizers here with the, the Roposas and, and the other people that are in this community, this battle must be won. This battle must be won or all is lost. It's that simple. And if we all pull together, especially in this community where a lot of groundwork's been done, a lot of groundwork, and, and the local officials don't want to face this, and they've done their best to shrug this issue off, and I, I think there should be responsibility for that. But if we all link hands and hold them accountable, and we get this on the radar in this county, it would make a difference around the globe. Well, I'm asking for help from everybody as far as raising awareness. And if we could just bring this to the light of day. Everybody asks, what do we do? How do we stop it? Legislation, petitions. If we organized and brought this to the light of day so that those participating know what they're participating in and everybody, everybody from every political stripe knows that they've been a lab rat and a test without their knowledge or consent, if we just got it to the light of day, you would see a shockwave around the globe from these programs. There is no greater crime in human history. I appreciate everyone coming tonight. I hope we'll all organize after this meeting. Instead of going home and writing this issue off as something we've covered, I hope people pull together and that we address this issue. Because if we don't, we don't have tomorrow. We literally won't. Our time horizon is, is short if we don't deal with this soon. Thank you very much.